Hello my friends and welcome back. Today, you know what day it is. I want to say this every week so bad. It's Wednesday, my dudes. It's hump day. Hell yeah. We survived half of the week and half is to go. But you know what didn't survive this week? Russian roads and the irrigation system that's supposed to guide water away from the cities. If you think I'm kidding, I am not. Spring looks the same every year in Russia and it gets worse and worse because if you don't maintain the city's water flowing infrastructure, then there's no thawing water will remain in the city. You might think that's a small thing, but it's a huge issue. It stops life in the city for a whole month if you don't guide your focus to it. This this is the Russian city of Saratov. This is not this like isolated place so ugly. It is a, a generic city in Russia. All of this like birds are singing. The girl who is filming this is like, look, spring outside. I feel so romantic. People are walking. And then she films this. The reality in Russia. Cue depressing classical music. Honestly, they don't even know what shit they live in. And just to illustrate that I'm not messing around, this is not an isolated event, this is another Russian city. As you can see, a huge central heating gas line right here, or hot water line. In Europe or in Estonia, they bury these underground for the longest amount of time now. But in Russia, they're still on the ground. One of the things from the Soviet Union is these huge lines on the ground. They don't bury them for some reason. They didn't back then. And Putin hasn't invested any new money to this infrastructure. You can see an army advertisement, go and die for Putin, basically. And here we can see a mother with a child, a child that has been produced for the Tsar to be killed in another war in 20 years. So while these guys, this guy is dying in Ukraine, this future soldier in this cart right here will be dying in 20 years, in two decades, under another Tsar. Life in Russia has not changed for the last 500 years. You still go and die for the Tsar and your life does not get better. But now, my friends, let's put this all you just saw into numbers. Because everything you saw comes down to two things. Money and political will. And we can even take the money away from this equation because Russia as a state has money. Russia could be a very rich, thriving nation. They have a lot of money. They are one of the most rich resource countries in the world, but the money is not used for uh, common good, for the Russian general public. It is used for um, army. The war in Ukraine is costing Russia $300 million every day, excluding sanctions and rearmament costs. And this comes from the Wall Street Journal, so they don't really throw around numbers. This is thorough calculations, $300 million per day. We are all used to in this war hearing these random numbers, oh, 1 billion, 300 million. What does it really mean? For understanding and clarity, what is $300 million? This is about 20 new modern schools for 1.5 thousand students each, built from scratch per day. You could build 20 schools per the daily cost of this war for Russia. Now, Russian school system is crumbling like their heating and gas system because when it was really uh, cold in January, we saw these heat water pipes burst because they froze broken and there was huge issues in Russia with that. Now you could fix all of that. You could build schools. You could build hospitals, for example. Two ultra-modern infectious disease hospitals. Literally the best possible from scratch per one day. All of this is not existing in Russia. They have the money, but they have not chosen to do that. All of the money goes to killing people, not making Russian people lives better. And the worst part is that Russian people are actually voting for the very president who is making these decisions. So they vote for their lives to be like that. They could vote differently. They could change it because Russia as a country has every mean to do so. Money, resources, building schools. They could build schools without Western aid. They could. 
They don't want to. In 2020, the Ministry of Construction stated that urgent repairs and replacement of 30% of all heating communications in Russia are necessary. This could be implemented for just the budget of 10 days of the war for the entire country. 10 days. Putin could just stop attacking Ukraine for 10 days and fix 30% that needs fixing. So the January humanitarian catastrophe, let's call it that, when a lot of the pensioners and peop people in the Far East, where their heating pipes, which are 50 to 60 years old, burst and it was minus 20 and they had to sit in cold for a week. Some people actually died because of that. Putin could fix that, like that. Boom, done, I'll fix it. He didn't. He decided to buy missiles and children. For the budget of one day of war, you can build 148 kilometers or like 80, 70 miles of a four-lane road of the highest category from scratch. Russian roads are known to be one of the worst in the world. Again, they could fix them because you don't need Western tech to do so. You can do solely made in Russia if you want to. He could do it tomorrow. He don't want to. As of today, there are about 2.5 thousand World War II veterans in Russia who are still not provided housing. And for Russia, Narodnaya Vaina, which is like the big uh, war of our forefathers, war of motherland, whatever they call it, the big word, which is like a religion in Russia. You, you don't understand. It's not like uh, May 8th in Europe. It's May 9th in Russia. It is Genbabed. It is a whole different religion. They worship that war, they worship the fallen, and they worship on that day the veterans. They show their worship at least. But these very veterans live in poverty and usually drink and they live in communal housings because Putin hasn't given them anywhere to live. Because they, they're broken from the head because they're veterans of World War II. They're 90, 95 years old, some of them. And they don't have housing. So I, another thing where if I was, let's put it bluntly, if I was the dictator of Russia right now, I take all of that oil money, I'll fix up the road, I'll build the schools, I'll fix the heating systems, I'll build hospitals, I'll build universities, hell, I'll build another railway to Siberia. Because I'm a builder like that, I think like that. But not Putin. He's a destroyer. Russians thank the authorities and Putin personally for the fact that they know better where to spend their money and that instead of building in Russia, they destroy in Ukraine. And of course, we have a Putin picture with a tire on top of his head. Yes, I think this thread illustrates perfectly the Russian mindset that they vote for this kind of spending and behavior. To hammer in that point even further, this is another illustration right now from Russia. This water is not a river, it's not a flood, it is just snow thawing water. Every spring in Estonia also, we have snow thawing water, but it is guided away according to European standards, because Europe actually has standards in the city how to guide that water away. That is the difference between Europe and Russia. In Russia, Putin does not want to uh, invest, although it wouldn't even take that much money. Building a missile is ex incredibly expensive. Fixing that issue would be cheaper, but it, it's not a priority to him because he lives in a golden castle. He doesn't really care about it. But this is the, the daily life of Russian citizens two times a year, when it's raining and when the snow is thawing. One is autumn, one is spring. Right now it's spring. Look at it. You just live in a huge lake, basically. It doesn't matter that this is supposed to be a street. It is not a tsunami here. It is just snow water. It's sometimes uh, hard for Western people to understand how can it be. Wow, the city should be doing something. Why isn't the city sh doing something? Well, because the city officials and governors of regions are named by uh, Putin's party and they are named after their values and loyalty. And their values have to align with Putin's values, which is war over everything. Now, my friends, we'll go to Ukraine and uh, I'll bring a little bit of sadness into you because this is a human touch. This is a love story that ended because of these very same Russian missiles that the money for could be going to building schools and hospitals. But it's going to buying these missiles, which are doing what I'm about to read you now. I love, but I'm not loved. The wife of the Ukrainian soldier and activist Kon Konstantin Miroshinchenko, call sign Mirosh, who died defending Ukraine, did the last photo session in remembrance of her husband. So this is Mirosh, and this is his wife, and he died 
because Russia decided to build missiles instead of schools. It's a political decision. It is not like they have to do that. They want to do that. So I just want to bring that in front of your eyes. I don't want the world to ignore this. This is personal pain. If you look at it from far away, it's just like a movie in the background. But if you really go into it, now if you're married or not, think about your wife, think about your husband. And they will be killed by a Russian missile. What would you do? How would you feel? All right, my friends, I cannot overwhelm you with uh, sad stories because for any kind of help to be given, the person who is in the position of giving aid has to feel good. So I'll end it now. Thank you for coming on this journey with me. But now we'll go on back to the positive track and I'll bring some humor into it. Because first, Ukrainian underground school is finished and now this is very important in connection with the previous topic. Russia is building missiles, building weapons, artillery shells. Ukraine also has to build them because they have to defend themselves or die. But they still decide to build schools at the very same time. Putin, who is not being attacked at the scale that Ukraine is not building schools, but Ukraine is. I mean, look at it. The first underground school, very fully underground, fully. Like, missiles cannot hurt this school. Artillery shells cannot hurt this school. Students can be safe and continue learning, even if there is a missile attack. The construction of the first underground school is complete. We're currently making finalization before classes begin. The building was constructed pursuant to the highest safety standards. It has 20 classrooms and is designed to accommodate 900 pupils in two shifts. Enrollment for the uh, next academic year is almost complete. Already this year, 600 children will sit down at their desks. Now, education is a basis, one of the basis of a fruitful life. It's not everything, but it's one of the very important pillars of fruitful life. In Russia, it is lacking because Putin decides not to build schools. And Ukraine finds resources, even amongst wars, when they cannot you know, sometimes pay their soldiers even, still to build schools. Now, this I will respect because this shows the values of a nation. And I do respect a lot of this. We're grateful to our international partners, construction companies and educators for bringing this strategically important project to the Kharkiv. And now, my friends, to jump back uh, onto a Russian topic. On this video, you can see a destroyed control room of a power plant previously supplying electricity to 700,000 people. 700,000 people. They have children, they have elderly, they have women, they have hospitals. All of these feeds from electricity. Russia knows this. The guy who pushes the button knows this and they decide to take it all away. Ukraine now lacking air defense. Russians are just destroying the country's power grid to force the majority of the population into Europe, massacre those that remain, then call it all Russia. This is a humanitarian catastrophe in the making and it is knowingly in the making in Europe. This is a war in Europe. So Russia knows what it's doing very well. They know the consequences and they're trying to weaponize immigration from Ukraine into Europe by destroying every last power plant in Ukraine, every last heating system. This is their um, acknowledged goal, a humanitarian catastrophe in Ukraine. But it's not going to work, my friends, and we'll jump to Russia because here in Moscow I'll bring you a, a derailed train. Always I love to see these videos because I can show them, first of all, in YouTube, like to show them. And second of all, because logistics is everything, especially in Russia where logistics is the most vulnerable part of their army, taking a train out is very cheap and very easy. And it, takes, it makes a lot of headache for the Russian army. And they did it in Moscow region, the, the castle of Putin in Russia. An emergency occurred last night in Dmitrov near Moscow on the Kostina Ivantseva section. Eleven freight cars of the uh, train derailed. Traditionally, there were no injuries and no harm to the environment. Like every time where something happens in Russia, there's no harm, no injuries, nothing. Don't worry about it. Just look the other way every time. Now specialists are restoring the railway track and clearing away the rubble. The circumstances of the incident are being investigated by the Moscow Interregional Transport Prosecutor's Office, according to Russian media. Yeah, <laughs> and look at this. Look at this one. Have you seen this partisan? We have a NAFO dog right here. <laughs> this guy, look at the face. That is the face of Russian society, the Russian in general. Look at this. Damn, bro is mad. 
My friends, Zelensky finally approved uh, another mobilization law in Ukraine. Now, this law was sent to Zelensky from the Ukrainian parliament, uh, Rada, it's called actually, Verkhova Rada. It was sent almost a half a year, almost a year ago, actually, but Zelensky only now gave a signature to it. Now, this law will bring down the draft age or conscription age to the army from 27 years to 25 years. So, let me tell you. Russian information operations have unfortunately been incredibly successful in stating that Ukraine is sending 16-year-old boys to fight. Yes, 18 to 60-year-old men cannot leave Ukraine according to the martial law, but in the army they have knowingly spared young men to give them a chance in life. 27 years and older Ukraine has been mobilizing these men. Now they brought it down to 25. So there's no forceful mobilization to younger than 25 years old in Ukraine right now. So <laughs> there's no way there's a 16-year-old boy in the Ukrainian army as the Russian information operation are putting it. If you see that, then just be aware that you're right now acknowledging a Russian information operation. It's 25 by law in Ukraine. You have to be 25 years old to be mobilized into the army. If you go as a volunteer, you can be younger, but you cannot be taken uh, mobilized if you're younger. So now it's 25 according to the new Zelensky signature on the new law. My friends, now some good news. We all know about the Czech-led initiative that is providing Ukraine with 1.5 million shells, which cost about 3 billion USD, about which half has been provided, 1.5 billion USD has been provided by different countries in the NATO and in, in the European Union, have has to be uh, provided more. Ukraine desperately needs these shells and they do, will, they, they will change the defense game and Russia will have enormous losses when these shells actually reach Ukraine. But this is not, this is not it, it gets better, it's like top shop, but wait, there's more. Estonia, my country, hey, has found 1.2 million additional shells for Ukraine on the global markets. The thing is, these shells exist countries in the world. They're outside of NATO and outside the European Union, mostly in South America and mostly in Africa. Yes, they have been countries aligned with the former Soviet Union and with Russia and Iran, but they do have shells. And if these shells save Ukraine and children and soldiers... I would also buy them. Now, Estonia has find one, found 1 1.2 million of such cells. At the latest meeting, Estonian Defense Minister Hanna Pevkur revealed that Estonia has identified 2 to 3 billion euros worth of artillery ammunition available on the global market in addition to the ammo sourced by the Czech-led initiative. That would mean something between 800,000 and 1.2 million shells, so somewhere in that ballpark, in addition to the Czech-led initiative. Those would be available quite fast too. Let's hope that funding for this is found as soon as possible. Now, of course, first we have to secure the funding for the Czech initiative. And I do, like, I'm certain they will secure it. They already have half of it. These shells will equalize Russian and Ukrainian shell amounts on the front. And since Ukraine is able to demilitarize so many Russians right now with their shortage, when they do get these shells, oh my god, you don't want to see the numbers then. We also know that out of the 3 billion euros required to buy 1.5 million shells, the Czech initiative has secured commitment of 1.44 billion. So half of the money is already secured. But th thanks to countries in the West and in the European Union, countries who understand what this war is and who Ukrainians are fighting for, and that Ukrainians are a wall, a steel wall between the empire of evil in the East and the European Union, the democratic values. In other good news, Ukraine's own Bogdana self-propelled howitzer production has increased to eight per month. Now, Ukraine is producing almost everything. They are focusing. They're not real. In the long term, Ukraine has plans to produce everything they're getting from the West right now to make it all on their own. And I love it. I love the fact. Because as a country, you could also just be dependent on other countries and just keep importing. But like Poland and like Ukraine, both of these Slavic nations have taken the goals of making everything their own. Ukraine is producing Bogdana their self-propelled howitzer. Poland is buying Abrams and K2, both are uh, Western main battle tanks. One is from South Korea, one is from America. But the conditions on the Polish arms purchases always is that they will be assembled in Poland, that they will build an assembling plant and a fixing plant and a spare parts plant in Poland. Now this is, I love it so much. 
Now, as a small country in Estonia, we cannot do that because for, for this bargaining chip, you need to have a big money, big wallet, big population. But we don't have that. So Poland has that and they're using that. It's like, OK, we're going to buy K2 tanks, but we're going to make them here. So you better be, bring your stuff here. So I, I love it. This is the right way to go. And Ukraine is also going that path. France is planning on increasing its production to 12 Caesar self-propelled Hauser per month, which is six times more than the two they used to produce each month before the war. Props to the French. Vive la France. I've seen so many good things about France recently and their respect points are on the highest of my list right now. Finally, the United States 155mm shell production is about to reach 36k a month. It's starting to reach acceptable levels and will increase even after June when the new factory will start running in Texas. Yeah, te of course it's Texas. I mean, if, if you think weapons production somewhere in the United States, what do you think of her? It's Texas, my dudes. Let's hope that we get even more such news in the future. Now, this final OSINT analysis about shells was done by Finnish NAFO guy Joni Askola. Twitter link in the description below. Thank you, Joni, for keeping us refreshed on these great news. And now, my friends, I will do buy me a coffee members. I'll butcher their names. And they are from yesterday and from previous week. So if you signed up in the last week, you will hear your name possibly today or tomorrow. And also ear bleeding will happen. So be advised. Keline, Derek, Todd, Jak, Mari, Jo, Kinzie, Torsten, MK, Raber, Beatrice, Vollem, Vollenman, Vaug, Vasem, Aulandelus. And finally, for the third day in a row, what the hell, man? Someone, someone, you have been here for three different lists. I, I take the list from Buy Me a Coffee. I, I don't make it up. You just, you, you're a fanatical. Believer in Ukraine, Someone, thank you. If you like my channel, become a monthly member or buy me a coffee and I'll be butchering your name into the orbit. Until my next video, which is tomorrow, my friends, subscribe and press the bell notification. Otherwise, you just won't be notified when I upload. Uh, Slava Ukraini and bye-bye.